live, guys. And uh, welcome back to uh, New European News Weekly. Uh, we have an interview uh, with uh, Candice Paul now. Uh, we'll be talking about a range of issues uh, to do with uh, sort of environmental issues uh, and uh, in in Canada. Um, Candice Paul is uh, First Nations uh, representative and activist from the uh, um, Dene tribe in uh, in uh, Canada, uh, near Saskatchewan, I believe. And uh, uh, welcome, Candice Paul. Uh, um, how are you? How are you keeping? And um, we, we obviously had you on from a previous uh, interview. Uh, um, uh, just very quickly, uh, could we have a quick update maybe on uh, on the situation after the fires, uh, very briefly? Sure. Uh, just recently, uh, the government of Saskatchewan has uh, asked uh, the uh, people of Saskatchewan to comment on how they handled the fire. But the Saskatchewan Government Employees Union is very, um, they've sent out a notice to all of the public about their interpretation of how it was handled and how the effects of all the financial cuts to their department made it really difficult to do effective firefighting. So I think the government is under fire on that one. And they've got an election coming up in April, so it might have an impact on them. They endangered 51 communities and 13,000 people with because they didn't put anything into firefighting. Sure, and I would uh, sort of draw everybody's attention to uh, europeannews.wordpress.com, where if you scroll down, you can find the interview with Candice Paul that was uh, talking about those issues uh, uh, indeed. And of course, since then, uh, we've also had a change in government in, in Canada. Um, and uh, possibly as a result of that, that incompetence or those incompetences uh, and others uh, that uh, people were picked up on. Um, so uh, what, what's your hopes and dreams for this, uh, this change of government? Uh, what's your first impressions? Uh, could, could you give us a bit of feedback on that? Well, there's there has been a change, but I'm not sure how it's going to affect uh, us as First Nations people. They are doing some things like increasing spending on education. I think a lot of it has to do with appeasing First Nations, because First Nations have been standing quite strongly in, in the last few years against uh, resource extraction development and... Uh, a lot of the issues like murdered and missing women, um, those kinds of things. So they need to, they need, they know they need to like appease us a bit, but they already have corporate lobbyists already embedded in their, in their government. And, uh, you know, he's not going to change anything about promoting, he's still promoting Keystone XL pipeline and other pipelines. And you know, the, we know the tar sands are having difficulties, uh, mostly because First Nations and, and our environmental allies are bringing attention to all of the dangers and risks and impacts being foisted on our lands and our peoples, um, that they haven't been able to get as many pipelines into um, into production and into uh, being built as they had hoped and so that's part of the reason tar sounds are, are starting to shut down yeah that's um, good news we heard there uh, yeah so other things though like we're stuck with with some of the things that the previous government did like signing the FIPA agreement with China and and that's like big contracts and big expectations for resource exploitation and we have you know no Canadians have seen it we, we don't know what's in it we just know that Canada can be sued if they don't meet their obligations that they assign to so uh, that that's that's a bit of a problem we also stuck with the contract with India to supply uranium so I don't know what they're going to be able to do about that um, do, you, do you think um, that, that uh, First Nations uh, uh, lobbying uh, might might uh, make the sort of government, you know, make at least get the ear of the government, uh, as well as other activists? Uh, well, he's promised to to have a better ear. I mean, the previous government had no ear at all. I agree, yeah. Um, 
but that was all election promises. We will have to see what develops there. But one thing that has got a lot of us uh, really concerned is he has no intention of rescinding the the bill the bill C fifty one anti terrorist act, at which pretty much would make most of uh, most environmental activists and First Nations people who are protecting lands into terrorists, I'll subject be- to arrest without charges and all of those things. Also, you know, we're being spied on constantly and stuff like that. So, so- we're basically seeing that as a. Uh- uh, uh, what's happening after the UK. The UK has obviously been bringing in many restrictive practices, uh, surveillance and arrests and uh, what have you, so and uh, intimidation. So, uh, But, but the, you're saying basically that this is really the case in, in, in Canada at the moment as well. Then. well it has been going on, yeah. um, maybe not the arrests so much without charges, but, you know, that's what happened to, to the people who stood up against uh, fracking in New Brunswick. A lot of, they're still in the courts. They're still going after the, there's still hearings going on. Um, two years later, uh, even though the company left and government changed, it's, you know, people are still being faced with these things. So, you know, that was put in place to, to kind of um, instill fear in people. So they won't stand up, and and that's cri- because it's critical to the deals that they've made that there are no obstacles. It's been quite effective in the UK actually to sort of dampen down uh, uh, people's uh, voices. I have to say. Yeah, and that's not something we we need right now, especially in light of, of the climate agenda. And we still don't know what they're going to do on climate. And apparently, this all the Prime Minister Trudeau and all of his ministers are intending to go to the climate um, summary in uh, Paris, but uh, we don't know what their intent will be, because they've got all this resource extraction agenda, which most of that resource extraction is is pretty um, damaging to climate. Yeah, no, you make a very good point, and in fact we have Charles Williams Diggs uh, coming on uh, in roughly about uh, 20 minutes or so, um, and he's actually an uh, independent uh, journalist with uh, Bellona, uh, and he's basically uh, trying to get to uh, the, the Paris uh, sort of climate change and uh, to report as an independent uh, uh, sort of reporter, um, and he's finding it very difficult, uh, and uh, apparently this is a similar thing that happened on the last COP, uh, where independent journalists, they, they're only wanting to get um, uh, journalists that uh, have, uh, uh, let me see, they have uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, corporate credentials, basically. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but having said that, though, uh, w- w- if you <laughs> you might want to tune into that uh, interview, um, it's uh, quite interesting, and I'm sure he's got uh, quite a bit to say uh, about about that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's and it's good that uh, independent uh, people are covering these things and talking about. It's extremely important, as we saw in the election here. I mean, I've never seen such uh, insanity going on during an election and so many people being um, swayed and pushed and pulled in all directions to be part of the election. It's uh, corporate... Corporate med- corporatization of the media has been a problem. I mean, getting the word out on our situations has always been a problem. And uh, one of the first things, though, that we did note was there was a free, um, free to question media. Um, what do you call that? When they have a press conference right after the election, and that hasn't happened in ten years. Okay. So. Well, maybe maybe they'll be encouraged to to spread out a bit after this. I hope so. All right. And, uh, I'm, well, I'll just say, uh, Jimmy, if, if, did you want to come in on this point? Uh, is there anything <laughs> well, you want to bring in? Well, well, there is. I've, I've got the script here, Sean, so, uh, but uh, you have to forgive me because uh, I wasn't really aware uh, we, we were going to even have any guests today. So, Candice, <laughs> well, welcome back to the show. I have to say, it's it's great to have you back. Great to hear your voice, uh, and uh, you're sounding in good form. And uh, and uh, are you back home yet? And uh, back to your 
Um, since the fires and stuff like that, have you? Uh, what's your situation? Are you everything getting back to normal there now? Everything is everything is sort of back to normal. Oh. There are some new issues um, because, especially with logging now. Um, there's an agenda to log and there was prior to the fires but they haven't changed their plans in light of the fact that so much territory was burned and our our peoples are really concerned about you know the animals needing places to recover yeah and they're starving the animals right. are starving yeah so when they cut down a green tree for 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 you know local purposes um and leave it overnight the rabbits have it stripped by morning right right so, so like yeah yeah know, they're cutting green stuff and not going after the burnt timber which is a very high concern oh, and okay. the fact that you know they're still going on with exploration in in areas now that are needed for the animals okay so like it's still an ongoing situation then so i i know our time is limited here candy and i know there's a kind of a little format here so um so I'm, I'm reading here uh, question number two, which is uh, this Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission denies Committee for Future Generations intervener status at Darlington uh, Power Plant relicense and hear hearings. What is that about, or w w what's what's going on there with that? Uh, uh, with um, that? The Darlington Power Plants are in Ontario, and they're they're it's a huge um, source of power for Ontario. Unfortunately, those power plants are 40 years old and they are beyond their mechanical safety limit. What is happening is they've applied for a license to keep them running for another 13 years. So there's hearings on this relicensing going on uh, shortly. And we had applied, our group had applied to be interveners on those hearings, but we were denied um, that status by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, apparently because our focus is too broad. And um, what they do is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission just narrows everything down so that it's only about right there when it has impacts all over the place. So we know that there's all kinds of aspects involved in, in the operations of the nuclear industry. There's politics, there's commerce and profits. But these regulators only focus on science, avoiding things like morality, humanity, wisdom, principle, conscience, all of which we as First Nations on the lands here who are being impacted and in other places as well where, you know, there's in the nuclear chain, um, we're being avoided. That's a way of avoiding how they're impacting us. So that denial has got some some other people really, really upset. And there's other th uh, and there's other groups too that have been denied status. So you know they're really avoiding the ones that will raise public conscience. We kind of beat them up the last two times we were at hearings. So they really don't like us much. No, because they 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 can't see or won't see the the humanitarian aspects of it. Like, but. Uh, only want to sort of like face the scientific uh, studies and the scientific story of the day. Okay, I, 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 and I, I yeah. And only the ones they approve of. R right. Okay. When you, think, when you get to them with facts beyond what they approve, they fall apart and they scramble. That's what we did to them. So, uh, um, have have you sort of been in direct communication with them on, say, around a round table, and uh, where you can sort of like put each other's uh, position on the table and discuss where everybody sort of like feels and stands on these situations, or is it all going on like uh, with a uh, with lawyers uh, and uh, how? <laughs> the commission sits on a dais above the people and they have um, security all about them and it's very, very, very formal and empirical and they, um, there is no round table and they're very arrogant in their approach right. and then they have like 
the nuclear industry on either side of you when you go to intervene to try and counter everything that you say, right? Right. So they've already pre-approved things. That basically, when it gets to this point, it's already pre-approved. They already agree with it. They they say that they've gone through it all. They've looked at all the science. It's good. Sounds, 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 like, sounds like Japan, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the nuclear industry in general. Yeah. That's how it's um, I was just going to bring you on to the point uh, three, actually, which we're going to talk about, and it's the Quebec BAPE report on the uranium industry issues. Um, now, uh, uh, what, what, what uh, can you tell us about that and the CNSC re response? Um, the Quebec BAPE report is a lengthy report that was commissioned to be done in all over Quebec, but mostly on, on the instigation of the Quebec Cree people in northern Quebec because companies wanted to start uranium mining in Quebec and this would have been all in Cree territory and the Cree along with about 3,000 different groups and organizations across Quebec asked for a moratorium so in order to get the moratorium they had to go through this this um, process and uh, that process ended in March, I believe, of this year, and they agreed completely with the Cree that this was not a good thing to have going on in their territories, and um, the economic reasons did not overshadow the human, the moral, the ethical responsibilities that the Cree felt. Um, towards keeping the uranium in the ground. And the CNSC response to that was uh, really scathing. They appealed to the Quebec Minister of the Environment and told them that, you know, based on science, there's absolutely nothing wrong with uranium mining and it can be all done safely and uh, appealing to them to overturn this report and ignore it and this moratorium and ignore it. Which tells me the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission isn't very um, hands-off on the decision-making processes. They are really strongly pushing to meet the demands of the agreements that these governments have made to sell uranium. Sure, sure. Using, using the legal mechanism generally by the sound of it. Yeah, yeah. So they, they basically scathingly attacked um, um, the First Nations people and the people of the of the hearing to try to counter the impact of having a moratorium in Quebec. Sure, sure. Well, that's a, an ongoing fight, then I take it. I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. They will keep as long as there's these deals in place. Uh, they will keep pushing for it. Sure. Uh, really, Quebec, I don't think, really has to worry because Saskatchewan is like, unfortunately, where we live, uh, there's no shortage of uranium. Sure. Uh, well, Jimmy, do, do you want to bring us on to the last point? Uh, we can talk about uh, something something to do with that, I think. Well, that is. Isn't that where we are now? Point number four, the Saskatchewan uh, uranium issues. What? Um, I'm not sure. There's not. It's not very clearly defined that point. So, um, is that where we're going? Is it? Yeah. 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 That that's mainly where you know I have my focus and my knowledge base. Um, recently, a company named Chemical, which is one of the largest uranium production companies in the world, based out of Saskatchewan, uh, opened its Cigar Lake mine, and it's really high grade ore. But uh, they paid media and transported them at their expense to the grand opening. So, you know, you can see how, you know, they are manipulating and influencing the news. And that's, that's a concern to us. Um, there's a really strong pro-nuclear propaganda campaign going on in Saskatchewan, including um, Chemical and... Uh, GE Hitachi and 
other in, uh, nuclear uh, corporations have given a lot of research dollars to the University of Saskatchewan, uh, funneling it through a, an or, a facility called the uh, Sylvie Fedoric Canadian Centre for Nuclear Innovation. And they have a CEO, president guy, that his name is Neil Alexander, he's from the UK, um, who is really strongly pushing and manipulating or influencing media on the pros of the nuclear industry. The goal in Saskatchewan with the Saskatchewan government that we have, which was closely aligned with the previous federal government, is um, to have the full meal deal on nuclear. They want value-added everything, so they want to produce it, they want to mill it, they want to refine it, they want to process it. They want to use it in nuclear power, especially uh, experimenting with our northern places and for only for the purpose of operating the mines with small modular nuclear reactors. And if that's the case, we're going to end up with nuclear waste, which we had previously were successful in eliminating our province from becoming a nuclear waste dump of the, of the nation. So um, that that is kind of their agenda. And, and what they're trying to do is really get social license from the people of Saskatchewan to do that. And any time, like just recently at the U of S Senate, um, University of Saskatchewan Senate uh, meetings, they had done the uh, Neil Alexander had done a presentation to the Senate and anybody who stood up to ask a question based on facts that we have very well researched um, was told that they were sad and misinformed and really denigrated in a really negative way which was pretty unacceptable. Right. Um, it was uh, kind of like a bully situation. But uh, what we've been following is, like, Saskatchewan Research Council has the Gunner Mine cleanup recently announced that they've assessed everything at the Gunner Mines. Gunner Mine was one of the very first uh, uranium mines in northern Saskatchewan. And for 50 years, the tailings have been blowing and flowing into the Athabasca Lake Athabasca, which is one of the biggest lakes in Saskatchewan. And uh, that was abandoned, it was an abandoned mine, it was left to do that, and it became the taxpayer's responsibility to clean it up. Even though this, um, this mine was in operation to feed the nuclear weapons program in the United States, it provided the, uh, the uranium during the Cold War, and uh, was left for left for the people. The, the northern Dene people actually, after it was shut down, government put a fish plant right on top of it. People came there with their families. Children played in this yellow cake. Good grief! That was left abandoned. Yeah. It, you know, this is. And then when we talk about that um, at the hearings and so forth. They don't want to talk about it. They say the Nuclear Safety Commission says that's a mistake of the past. Well, no wonder the people of Quebec don't trust the industry. We don't trust the industry. Of course. So a report just came out that it's going to cost like $250 million minimum to continue with cleanup. The province wants the feds to kick in half. And the feds aren't willing to do that. Sure. So, you know, who's responsible and who's going to be responsible for these new mines and the cleanup of them? No, it's all of it's all a big experiment. They don't know if it's going to how long they're going to have to look after it. Sure. And as as time goes by, erosion is still gonna have a part to play in this. Yeah, that's early. So we're uh, 
we're we're very concerned about that. Um, there's a lot of exploration going on in northern Saskatchewan, especially in um, in the northwest, where they found a huge deposit of high-grade uranium ore at Patterson Lake. And I just finished reading their plans on uranium ex exploration and the uh, pro promotional magazine put out by the mining companies in Saskatchewan. It's the only magazine we get in northern Saskatchewan free, you know? Right. So it's all very... Well, talk, talking, about, talking about that, I mean, I was thinking about the PR machine that goes behind this. And, uh, of course, we've been looking into it a little bit. And after our interview with you, uh, we, got, uh, we got looked at by, um, or checked out by uh, a sort of a corporation that checks out uh, blogs or the internet uh, for uh, damage to corporations to find out how much impact the damage there would be. Um, <laughs> so it was quite funny, wasn't it, Jimmy? Do you want to, hmm. can you remember much about it? <clears throat> what, what, what exactly was this one, Sean? The, uh... uh, that was uh, on European News Weekly. We started getting checked out by this uh, corporation. We discovered this link that was checking us out. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. We were we couldn't figure out like who are these guys, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, we, tra yeah. we tracked them back, and it was to uh, part of the PR mechanism uh, where they're trying to uh, deal with the problems of uh, bad news, like your interview right now, um, and and. And how they how they're going to deal with the the impacts, or maybe come up with strategies to for this or that. It's hard to say exactly what they do. It's certainly possible they can do a hell of a lot. They'd be like um, a clean up operation, basically. So, yeah, like for yeah. example, da Candy she damage be, limitation, damage yeah. limitation, like and uh, in the PR sense, so that like you know yeah. they could sort of like pit their wits against sort of like activists who come in and tell the truth and say, okay, well perhaps we can spin it in such a way. <laughs> And make it sound, uh, you know, that we're the good guys, and this, you know, that these activists, you know, That's exactly you know. what's going on. Yes, for yeah. some time now, there has been, uh, well, at least two, three years now. Every time I do anything public, and any of our group do anything public. Um, there is, we're being tracked. It, I think that's the best way to put it. Yeah. I mean, we, we've been covering uh, all the aspects of the track uh, being tracked and harassed, and we, we've seen that on the west coast of Ireland with Shell. Uh, we've seen that uh, with the BP Gulf oil spill, uh, and indeed we had an interview with Charles Williams Diggs from uh, Bologna, an uh, independent journalist, um, and uh, he'll be uh, being interviewed next, actually, by the way. So um, I'd, I'd like to possibly hook you two guys up. I, I think uh, he has some uh, interests in in uh, in uh, some of the Canadian uh, energy issues, you know. Uh, but, uh. Especially since we're, you know, and getting back to that, like um, with this whole Patterson Lake deal. I mean, it amazed me how in their writing everything is breaking apart value, the true value of the land. The water, um, nothing to do with the impact on the culture of the people in the north. It just talks about money and production and how that's so great. So basically, there is no interest in our lives, just in the profits for the shareholders. Sure. That's all they're interested in. Well, I covered, I covered some issues in Japan uh, and. When I was looking into, you know, Fukushima and what have you, I was trying to find out what, you know, what Japan was like, you know. And indeed, when we look at 1990, you know, that sort of time frame and on, uh, we saw that Japan was being very open and, and they, had, uh, they were doing reports every year and they were discussing in the reports, basically, the impact on environment to the profit uh, uh, balance, the equation that, that they were using and, uh, and that the, uh, the social impacts and environmental impacts had to be taken into account. Um, but of course now with TTIP and all these other things, we're seeing just a pure profit uh, sort of driven with the, this equation just seems to have been thrown out of the window. It has in Japan and uh, we're seeing it unfortunately all around the world, you know. Yeah, like right now we see that Russia is ramping up its nuclear programs. Yeah. So you know the US and the UK are going to try and follow suit. Yeah. Uh, that goes all the way back 
to the Cold War thing with the weapons. It hasn't ended. It's nowhere near the point of ending. Look, we, so, have a, we have a much more powerful China uh, involved with that as well now, though. So. Yeah, we do, and they are really ramping up for nuclear push, too. So. Sure, sure. As is well, India. Fingers crossed we'll, uh, we'll do something about it, and uh, we've certainly got ICANN and Greenpeace and many others out there, uh, you know, CND and what have you, trying to, uh, trying to stop this nuclear madness. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for giving us a, a sort of a heads up on what, you know, where all this stuff comes from, you know, the, in terms of uranium mining and its impact on the environment. And um, maybe we can get a, an interview where we could talk about some of the impacts uh, in, in more detail, um, if you're okay with that. That would be great. Okay. Well, I've got Charles Williams Diggs uh, waiting in the uh, the wings here, um, and uh, by all means, if you, I'll, I'll drop you a link if you want to listen to the interview. Uh, it's uh, very interesting, and um, uh, it uh, yeah, it uh, we'll uh, we'll basically have more information on this later. But uh, we're certainly going to be covering some aspects of the uh, um, the issues around the uh, uh, Paris uh, climate change uh, conference. Yeah. In terms of Independent journal. Don't want to see that the green com the green promotion of nuclear energy as an answer to climate change. Yeah, That's nasty. <laughs> That's very nasty. <laughs> but uh, and for fortunately, it's been pretty well debunked by uh, by many people. Um, yeah. So. But uh, we'll, we can get to that in the future as well. Thank you so much uh, for coming along, uh, Candice. As always, it's uh, you, you're a great, great speaker, and uh, and and you've uh, certainly covered a, a really important part of uh, of what's going on. It's, it affects us all, um, and um, you know we're, we're uh, definitely supportive of your campaigns, um, and uh, we hope to hear more about them in the very near future. Thank you. Thanks, Candice, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back soon. Thanks. Take care. You too.